Um, but with that, I'd love to, uh, to bring up or kind of intro our, fir our, our keynote speaker, uh, Derek Daly. So he is an Irish legend, dri or, excuse me, Irish driving legend, Derek Daly. He's the epitome of a complete champion. From the victory podium to the announcer's desk, Hall of Fame race car driver and network television analyst, Derek Daly has spent nearly three decades as the face of the motorsports world. He is the CEO and founder of Motivation, an innovation learning company and the author of Race to Win, How to Become a Complete Champion. Before we meet Derek, we're gonna enjoy this short video to learn a little bit more about him. More people went up in the space shuttle than ever got to race in the Formula One World Championship. Fewer still also raced at the Indy 500. Derek Daly, who was born and raised in Dublin, Ireland, is one of those select few. From a working class family, to laboring in the iron ore mines of Australia, to the top 10 in the Formula One World Championship. Derek Daly has breathtaking experiences, including helping to pull a fellow driver from a burning wreckage in just his second Grand Prix race in Monza, Italy, a crash that proved fatal. Derek suffered devastating injuries while surviving the hardest impact a driver had ever survived at that time in a 200 mile per hour crash at the Michigan International Speedway in 1984. After nine surgeries, he returned to racing and won the 12 hours of Sebring Endurance Race twice in 1990 and 1991. Television broadcasting was a natural step for Derek. USA Today called him the best new face on motorsports television. ESPN nominated him for a Cable Ace Award. He has worked around the world for Fox Sports Speed Channel, Network 10 Australia, NBC Sports, and CBS Sports. <laughs> we have Derek Daly, the famous announcer, calling the race for us. Made the best moment, Paul. Do you have any advice or otherwise for your man here? Pray for your life. In 1999, the Derek Daly Performance Driving Academy in Las Vegas coached Sylvester Stallone prior to him making the motorsports movie Driven. In December 2000, Derek received the prestigious Hall of Fame award from Motorsport Ireland for his leadership of Irish motorsport. In 2002, he founded Motivation, a learning and development company that transfers the admired high performance skills of the world's great race teams into corporate culture. He is also the author of Race to Win, How to Become a Complete Champion, forwarded by the legend Mario Andretti. Having lived and worked all across the globe, it's the motorsports world where Derek learned how true high-performance teams really operate, what speed and flawless execution really means, what world-class preparation is, why change fuels success, and what it really means to have a team of people aligned. He has shared his powerful analogies and business lessons with many of America's top companies, both nationally and internationally. Please welcome Derek Daly. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So you're going to have two and a half days of business meetings. I'm going to take my time this evening to take you down a different track. Excuse the pun. Instead of me talking about how you operate your PC, your business, I want to take you into my world. Peel the curtain back, if you like, on a sport at the highest levels that's colorful, glamorous, success-oriented, fast-paced, and sometimes risky. I was one of those lucky few people who got to live my dream. My dad sold vegetables out of a corner grocery store, and I got to race in Formula One and at the Indy 500, in the fastest, most sophisticated racing cars on the planet. And it's a sport that pushes people right to the edges of what might be possible. And when I tell people it's a sport of exacting human performance that operates under pressure in compressed time frames, people tell me, well, my business is going a bit like that. In a fair to say, in the world that we all now live in, we're all being pushed out towards the edges of what might be possible. My sport makes great demands on people. It demands high performance thinkers and high-performance behaviors. But do you know it's almost impossible to mandate high-performance? But what you can do 
is you can set high enough standards and have committed and aligned people dig deep within themselves to see what can be fulfilled. Now, if I talk a little funny, I'm from a place called Ireland. Hands up. Has anyone ever heard of Ireland? Yeah. Great place. It's a long way from here. I was there just two weeks ago. If ever you go to Ireland, you'll work out very quickly. They're a very friendly group of people. Love to get together and have a chat. Love to go out and have a drink at night. They love to go out in the morning and have another drink. <laughs> you know, if you ever you're, have the pleasure of being in a pub at the end of the night in Ireland, they'll tell you you're not really drunk as long as you can still lie on the floor without holding on. And so it was a bit of an unusual environment for me to go to my dad when I was 12 years of age and tell him I wanted to become a professional race car driver. We had a grass patch outside our house. All the kids played soccer. That's just what you did. My dad told the neighbors who came to buy their groceries that I came from very much a privileged upbringing. He said, if I wanted to do anything out of the ordinary, I would have the privilege of finding a way to do it all by myself. <laughs> and I was actually okay with that. But I had no idea the trek I would go on. I had no idea the experiences that I would be forced into at a relatively young age. Now, you know I was a race car driver, and you know what a racing car looks like. Well, have a look at my very first race car here. Yeah. When you be part of your son, if he came home and said, Dad, I'm going to be a professional race car driver, I bought my very first car. I went to the tow it on the end of a rope, down through our neighborhood streets, put it into the garage at the back of our house, because that's where I was going to work on it. That was my reality. I was 16 years of age. You know, back then, I was the youngest driver in the Republic of Ireland to hold a competition license. Today, I'd be at least 10 years too late. Kids are racing go-karts now at five and six years of age. Everything just happens so much faster. I went all the way from here to the World Championship in Formula One. And yes, I did have hair at one stage. But Formula One was an amazing time. Our season started off in Argentina, second week in January. We would stay out for two weeks, go to Sao Paulo, Brazil for the Brazilian Grand Prix, same racetrack they use today. Go back to Europe, regroup, rebuild the cars, go off to South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, back to Europe, rebuild the cars again. Different country every two weeks, Spain, Italy, Germany, uh, England, Monaco. Um, it was also a bit of a risky time because in my time in Formula One, in just the five years I was there, one in every eight drivers lost their lives just doing what I was doing, living a dream, man a machine against man a machine. The white car that you see here is the Williams car. That was the last Formula One car I raced. They're still active in Formula One today. You know, back then, the last year that I raced, we spent $25 million on a budget to race two cars. People said it'll never last. You'll never generate that amount of commercial sponsorship year in, year out. Today, to run at that level today, it's $250 million of a budget, and it's never been bigger. Formula One today, statistically, is the largest watch sports platform in the world. The major manufacturers use it to make a statement. Our designers, our engineers, our technology, our team of people will go against our showroom competitors under the watchful eye of global television and prove that we are the best of the best. It's an amazing platform. The lap record speed when I raced there the last year was 160 miles an hour on a three and a half mile road course. And I thought that was impressive until I went to a place called Indianapolis. When I got there, they were doing 200 miles an hour. And the amazing thing for a European road racer, they were doing it between two concrete walls. Hands up, has anyone here ever driven at 200 miles an hour? Intentionally? <laughs> Just to give you an idea, if you did go at 200 miles an hour, you'll cover the full length of a football field every second. You know, today, it's not even considered fast. Do you know today, you're not even allowed past your rookie test at the Indy 500 if you can only do 200 miles an hour. In fact, if you can only go 200 miles an hour, they'll black flag you off the racetrack and send you home. Because 200 miles an hour at Indy these days, you're considered to be a hazard. You get in people's way. 
they send you home until you get better. Isn't that an amazing business model? If you can't stay up with the competition, they send you home. In my career, I went through three different eras. Clearly different eras, very distinct. I went through eras that were from good to great to extraordinary. In the 80s, it was the good era when good teams could hire good people, do a good job, and be successful. But then technology came into our sport in the 90s. Suddenly, the engineers had reams of data and all sorts of software, and it was only a smaller number of great teams could actually use the software to increase their performance. But then it took another shift from good to great to extraordinary because the smaller number of extraordinary teams was in the 21st century. Because when we crossed over there, the regulations tightened down. Suddenly, we didn't have the freedom to design and build whatever car or engine we wanted. Everybody was forced to use about the same chassis, about the same amount of horsepower, the same tires. So now, a smaller number of extraordinary teams were forced to outthink their competition, both on and off the track. And those three eras are very clear, and we today are living in an era of extraordinary. There's no magic, you just have to operate out on the edges of being extraordinary. Now, one of the occupational hazards to our sport is the speed that we run. And if things go wrong, it can be catastrophic. Well, it went wrong for me in 1984 when I lost control of my car, had a 217 mile an hour impact against the concrete wall. The red arrow there is pointing to the V, that's my legs. The car's rotating at 150 miles an hour trying to throw me out. I'm strapped in with a six point harness. The front you see is already broken off the car. The impact was so violent. This was actually, you see me in the middle of that mangled wreckage. This was actually measured as the hardest crash impact a driver had ever managed to survive. And you see this picture here as the car rolls down off the banking there, my legs dangling out the front as I roll down towards the safety crew. They rush over, put me on the stretcher. The head of trauma for the racetrack said, we better fire up the helicopter and get them to intensive care because there's no way we can treat the injuries we're probably going to see here. And after I was transferred from the Michigan Hospital to Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, and after 19 surgeries and three years in therapy, I don't mind telling you, this accident pretty much changed my life. It changed the trajectory my career was on. It even made me question what's going on. Because when you suffer injuries like that, it's so difficult to process what the next move might be when you're in such pain. And I had plenty of time to think about it in the days after because I got get well wishes from everybody, all sorts of friends. People would come into my hospital bed, on my hospital room and say, are you going to go back racing again? Or an even more pointed question was, why would you ever consider going back to a sport that all but killed you? To give you an idea of the injuries, I had severe dislocations on my right foot, right uh, heel, and lost all the uh, right ankle, lost all the soft tissue on my heel because it ran along the ground. I had a toe traumatically amputated on my left foot. I had a crushed left ankle that took a bone graft from my hip to rebuild an ankle joint with four plates and 18 screws and an 18 inch rod. Double compound fracture on my left leg, broken hip joint, broken pelvis, broken ribs, broken hand, broken arm, third degree burns, had a lacerated liver. For good measure, the blood transfusions were laced with hepatitis C. I don't know whether you're familiar with hep C, but back then on Time Magazine in the 80s, it was known as the silent killer. There was no pain, but it ate your organs from the inside out. It was a mess. And it's hard to process something like that. And it was really difficult for me until I thought about the conversation I had with my dad when I was 12 years of age. And when I had that conversation with him, he told me two things. 
He said, I will help you in every possible way with your career, as long as it's not financial help you need. I knew exactly what that meant. And then he said, always remember, you'll be responsible for the legacy that you leave in the sport. That went completely over my head until this accident. And suddenly I realized I would never want this to be the legacy that I would leave in the sport. So I had to recover. I had to get strong. I had to get race fit. I had to get myself back to a race car. I had to get back into a racing team. I had to go back and compete again and then be able to leave on my own terms because this was not the legacy that I wanted to leave. And I realized the power of that word legacy. When I was 12 years of age, I heard it probably for the first time, didn't understand it, but I realized the power it had. And then I realized we're all in control of the legacy that we leave, right? Everywhere. In our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our jobs, everywhere. So if we know that, let me ask you a question here. If there was a book written about your business, and if there was a chapter in it about you, what would you like it to say? Amazing, the power of that word legacy. So an amazing set of circumstances began to fall into place when I'm in recovery. I went to the last IndyCar race of the year. I was in a wheelchair. I did an interview with ESPN that turned into a 10-year contract. A week after the interview, I had a call from ESPN. Derek, would you like to do color? I said, sure. I had absolutely no idea what I just agreed to. I never heard the term color before. I wasn't familiar with American television vernacular, but a color commentator gets paid to travel the world to talk about the sport. I thought, what a gig when I'm in recuperation. And I met some amazing people in the year that I was doing television broadcasting. I spent 20 years with Paul Newman. Paul Newman was a co-team owner of the Newman Haas team based in Chicago that Mario Andretti drove for. Paul was a passionate racer himself, loved the sport, and every day he would keep telling me, make sure you tell the people how many people turned up and how, how the sta grandstands are packed. I spent six days with Stallone. I had a racing school in Las Vegas, and Sylvester Stallone wanted to do a movie called Driven about IndyCar racing. Now, Rocky is obviously his perfect movie because he's a boxer at heart. He understands it and knows about it. So to be a race car driver, he wanted to spend six days, I was his personal coach in Las Vegas at our racing school, understanding what it takes. He might have been the worst student we ever had through the racing school, but he was a $50 million a movie guy at the time. I mean, he was a megastar. Maybe the athlete or the hero that had most influence on me was Muhammad Ali. I got to spend time in his home with him in Los Angeles. An amazing time. I remember as a kid watching Cassius Clay become Muhammad Ali and all those great heavyweight fights when we were in Ireland. But it wasn't the people that I was impressed by. It wasn't the people who fascinated me in television broadcasting, it was the research. Because you know when I researched the number of teams of people, extraordinary teams of people in our business who ever got to celebrate on the victory podium, you know the victory podium in our sport. You know in Formula One where they shake the champagne and spray all the mechanics and the engineers all in the celebration. The podium is actually a place where they also make a statement. The teams make a statement on that day against our competition, no matter what the pressure was, no matter what the decision making was, our team of people proved that we were the best of the best. In Formula One, despite the champagne, the Indy 500 has a most unusual um, 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 victory circle, a victory ceremony. They hand the victory uh, lane driver, the winning driver, a bottle of milk. It's been gone on since 1936, and the winning driver said, I'd love to have a drink of my favorite beverage, which was milk. The Indiana Dairy Association said, what an amazing sports tradition we could create. And ever since then, they hand the winner a bottle of milk. But the podium is exclusively reserved for winning teams of people. 
But the research that fascinated me was when I looked at the number of teams who ever get the privilege of celebrating, I realized the number was so incredibly small. And I asked a really basic, simple question, why? Why was the number so small? What was it that they did? Did they communicate differently? Did they plan differently? Did they execute differently? Were they better under pressure? I had access to everybody. Roger Penske, Mario Andretti, A.J. Foyt, Danny Sullivan, Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton. I had access to everybody. When I asked them the question, the answer was fascinating. And I'm going to share with you some of those answers this evening. So the first time I went to the Indy 500 looked a bit like this. That's my very first pit stop in the Valvoline car in 1983. My heart was pounding through my chest. But the interesting thing about when I went to the Indy 500, the magic lap speed was 200 miles an hour. And there was only about four or five drivers that could do it. I wasn't one of them. It became frustrating because I was told as a European road racer from Formula One that I didn't understand the technique of how to go fast on an American super speedway. I was told to go walk down the pit lane, find a veteran of the sport, and ask him what's the technique I don't understand. I went down to Mario Andretti. We raced together for five years in Formula One. I said to him, I said, Mario, can you, can you, can you share with me what this technique is that I don't understand, apparently. He said it's very simple. He said the next time you go out, when you're going down the long front straight, he said tell your brain to tell your foot not to come off the gas pedal until after you've turned the steering wheel deep down into the first corner. So I get strapped in to my race car. We have about 950 horsepower back in those days, so this thing would fly down the straight. I drive out of the pits, down the back straight, come down the front straight. I'm doing about 220 miles an hour down the front straight, and the wind's absolutely whistling by, and I see the first corner coming, and I remember exactly what he said to me. Now, the closer this first corner got, I'm not so sure I'm brave enough to do what he said. And then a flash of scare went across my mind, thinking, do you think he told me the truth? <laughs> I wasn't brave enough. I backed off. I drive around another lap. I come down again. I know exactly what he told me to do. I get towards it. I still wasn't close enough. I backed off. Third time, I'm determined. I'm going to go all the way down. I come down the front straight. I'm flying into the first corner. I see it coming. I white knuckle down on the steering wheel. I puck her down to the seat belts, hold my breath all the way to turn one, drive her deep down, then back off. Car had lots of grip, much faster corner entry speed. And then I did the same at turns two, three, and four and flashed by the start finish line at 200 miles an hour right there because I learned this new technique. And of course, I thought he told me the technique to help me. And then I realized he didn't. He told me the technique to help him and everybody else who might be around a rookie at 200 miles an hour. Can you imagine open wheel race cars at 200 miles an hour with a rookie making unusual or abrupt moves? It could be catastrophic. And then I realized I trusted my life to Mario and the information he was going to share because of the speeds that we go. And I send young drivers for his counsel today because we can trust him implicitly. And then I realized trust is the very foundation of these extraordinary teams who operate out on the edge of what might be possible. And you never build trust faster within your team than taking what you know and sharing it with the people around you to make them better. Trust, the very foundation of all teams in any activity who want to operate out on the edges of what might be possible. Because amazing things happen when somebody's got your back. So I mentioned the, uh, the model of motorsports earlier, where they send you home. Before we go any further, let me just throw up what a high-performance motorsports model might be. Large groups of well-managed people, 
communicate effectively, lots of variables, work in harmony together as they execute the plan. Innovative people embrace change, strict deadlines, intense pressure at times, yes. And their focus is on the restless pursuit of marginal gains. We no longer have a magic box of tricks of a racing car that somebody else won't have. Most industries don't have suddenly a magic box product that nobody else has. So it's the restless pursuit of marginal gains that makes the difference in our sport, maybe in your business. You know the beauty of this business model? The results of how you operate your business are transparent every Sunday afternoon. You get your report card right there. You know exactly how you did against your competition. But this model no longer works. You can no longer be successful just with this model because you have to surround it by a culture. And I love to see Scott earlier throw up that culture of excellence because in our business, when you talk about culture, now culture is not some abstract thing because it's a buzzword for a lot of people, but culture in my business is something that has to be embedded into the DNA of each team member. And the culture in our business is not a culture of winning, and it's not a culture of success. We like to call it very much a culture of extraordinary. And, and that word keeps coming up. A small number of extraordinary teams do extraordinary things, and the culture of extraordinary. I want to give you a feel for what this looks like in my business. Because imagine, imagine for a minute that we're dressed in sponsored uniforms, we're part of these teams. I want to give you a feel of what they think, how they think. These team members all live convinced that they could be beaten tomorrow. Think about that. They take it home with them at night. It's in their DNA. They live convinced if we're not careful, if we're not watching what's going on around us, we as a team could be beaten tomorrow. I call these profounds of the culture of extraordinary. Here's another one. All of these team members understand that critical performance gains occurs at the margins and at the boundaries of their people and equipment, right out on the edges of what their people can do and what their equipment can do. Let me show you another one. All of these people in these teams are trained to disbelieve in the sustainability of their own performance. Think about that for a second. It doesn't matter if you won last Sunday, you better disbelieve that's sustainable. You become most vulnerable in times of great success. Doesn't matter what quarter you had or what year you had, you better believe it's dis disbelieve in the sustainability of, of your own performance. It's just an amazing platform where these teams operate. So that's some of the soft skills and I want to stay right on time here. We are good. Let me show you one of the hard skills. It might seem pretty easy, preparation. But at 230 miles an hour, six inches from a concrete wall, what type of team and what type of preparation would you like to have behind you? And unlike other sports that I know, poor preparation in our business can cost you your life. Do you think it's a coincidence when I do my television interviews on the front of the starting grid of the Indy 500, do you think it's a coincidence right up the front of the grid I will inevitably see the best painted, best sponsored, best prepared cars right up the front of the grid. And they start at the front of the grid because I've already gone through qualifying and they've earned the position that the fastest team, fastest car, best executors. And all the team members will be immaculately dressed standing beside the car, knowing that all the job lists have been taken care of as well, maybe even better than everybody they're in competition with. Now, do you think it's a coincidence? When I move to the middle of the grid for my television interviews, I see some pretty good teams there. They're glad to be in the Indy 500. Now, these teams are already looking forward to other teams of people who've already demonstrated they've done a better job so far. The race hasn't even started yet. 
Now, do you think it's a coincidence? Now, I took all these photographs, by the way. When I move to the back of the grid, I no longer see as many immaculately dressed mechanics. I no longer see as much sponsorship support for these teams. And in fact, if you look closely at this uh, photo here, there's a mechanic. He's on his hands and knees. He's actually got tools in his hands. He's working on the gearbox on the starting grid of the largest single day attended sports event in the world. Now, do you think it's a coincidence? The fallout and failure rate at the Indy 500 also starts from the back of the grid and goes forward because it's directly proportional to the preparation those teams of people put in before they go against the competition. And the back of the grid is inevitably populated by teams of people who have all the resources available to them, just didn't avail of them, or maybe resent that things have changed so fast and they just wish it could be like it was all those years ago, which it never will again. But there's a double whammy to being on the back of the grid in my business. The first whammy is you've taken yourself out of a position of advantage. The double whammy is you've given an advantage to your competition. Now, what makes these presentations really worthwhile to me is if I thought everybody here took away one nugget. You can take away more, but if you took away one that you could use and potentially radiate to people within your sphere of influence, we'd have had a good mission. This might be one of them. Because let me ask everybody a question here. As regards your preparation, or the preparation of the people within your sphere of influence. Where do you think you are on the starting grid of the race you are now in every day? Whenever I ask that question, everybody knows their own personal answer. And if you don't see yourself clearly up the front of the grid, you probably have all the resources to get yourself there. But here's the magic. The closer you see yourself to the front of the starting grid when you ask yourself that question, the closer you are to emulating those extraordinary teams who get themselves in a position to celebrate on that victory podium more often. So from here on in, every day when you lock the door at home, when you leave home in the morning, I'd love everybody here to ask a question. As regards my preparation, where am I on the starting grid today for the race I'm now in every day? And I believe that question can nudge people as much giftedness as there is in this room here. And you're here because of the giftedness you have. But if it could just be edged even closer to the edge of what might be possible. Can you imagine a kick for me that my sport could potentially push people towards that outer edge with that one word preparation? Anybody here? Anybody here think you could over prepare? Hands up for what you do every day? No, probably not. Well, you can over prepare to race at the Indy 500. Because it happened to me the first time I went there. Remember, our Formula One races were an hour and 45 minutes long. When you do a 500 mile race like the Indy 500, it's three and a half hours long. It's in the Midwest, could be 90 degrees, could be 80% humidity. We wear three layers of fireproof clothing. It doesn't breathe that well. That's part of the reason why it's fireproof. There's no air conditioning. So the buzzwords amongst drivers in their preparation for the race would be prehydration. Drink as much as you can before you get into the car for a long, hot, sweaty afternoon. Now, the clever team managers actually put a drink bottle on board the car. Little plastic bladder sat in the side pod. Little electric motor on it, like the windshield washer bottle on your road car. A little plastic tube came out of the top of it, come up between our seat belts. We would drill a hole in our helmets, push the tube in. At any time during the Indy 500, you could push a button on the steering wheel and get a nice cold drink of iced water or Irish whiskey for an Irish fella, whatever made you go fast. Anyway, have you ever thought what might happen if you drank way too much before you ever got into the car? So first time I'm there, we're only 70 laps in. We're under yellow, lots of time to think and I have such a pain. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do here? 
I thought, I can't make a pit stop and run to the porta potty in the middle of the Indy 500. That would be a hell of a press release. And then I thought, well, I'm going to be in here for another two and a half hours. Maybe I'll just go ahead and go in the seat. In two and a half hours, it'll all be dried up. No one will ever know. So I did. It was a wonderful relief. The only problem was my engine blew up two laps later, and it was still running out the bottom. Oh, now look. OK, so the culture of extraordinary. The three profounds I just showed you, let me add to those. Let me add number four to the culture of extraordinary. All of these team members are individualistic in their thinking, but they become team members in their actions. Do you see what that is? Whatever they touch, they're individualistic thinkers on how to make micro improvements and then come back as team members in their actions. Let me show you this one. They encourage innovation. Creates new sources of performance. By the way, I, I have a PDF of all these um, um, that I can share with Aaron, who, who can get it to everybody afterwards, because I see a lot of people taking photographs. Encourage innovation. New sources of performance to improve both the efficiency and effectiveness of the process. Do you see that? We don't have magical racing cars that are faster than everybody. It's the very process of how we go about our racing that separates those extraordinary teams. Might be the same in your business. I love this one here. Look at this one here. Number six, success for our teams requires a portfolio of leaders, individuals throughout the organization, willing and capable to accept responsibility of leadership, regardless of the formal authority. You don't have to be told you manage those people over there. You don't have to have a, na a name tag or some sort of designation. You are expected to be part of a portfolio of leaders that can be relied upon for all of these teams who operate out on the edges of what might be possible. Now, the team I raced for that probably understood this best of all was the great British Jaguar team that I raced sports cars for at the Le Mans 24 hour race in France. They also happened to build the fastest racing car I ever drove. This beast of a thing here did 248 miles an hour down the straight in the daytime. Nighttime, 251 in the dead of night. Cool, dense air in France makes more horsepower in the engine. This was a beast of a thing. But this team had an amazing structure and culture. Let me show you what it looked like. This team had the formal structure of a big organization, but in addition, they also had an informal structure in place that allowed the team to adapt and change quickly. Why? At the Le Mans 24-hour race, remember, this is major manufacturers going head-to-head -head for 24 hours, again, to make a statement. Not only are we faster than our competition, but we are reliable for the long, long haul. But this race has a rule that says the mechanics can only work on the car if it's in the pit lane. The racetrack is seven miles long. If something breaks during the early hours of a race, the driver is expected to somehow jimmy-rig the thing to hopefully get it back to the pit lane so the mechanics can fix it and you get on your way. Well, I happened to be um, with the Jaguar team. We had the best car. Uh, my team, it was Davey Jones from Houston, Texas. He did the first two hours of the race and um, before he had gearbox trouble. But do you see this here? Let me just emphasize this again. Do you, see, do you understand the informal structure that's in place? By the way, we, what we call this is being highly aligned and loosely coupled. Just think about that for a second. Highly aligned is the structure of the big organization. Loosely coupled is the frontline team of people who are empowered to make quick decisions with limited information. Because remember, when a driver comes screaming down the pit lane at 4 a.m. in the morning, he's on the radio saying, I need this, 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 and this. There isn't time for a committee meeting. They are empowered to make quick decisions with that limited information, and they do it. But by the way, this only works when the trust factor has been laid, because they know somebody's got my back. 
I think that structure is going to permeate through a lot of companies in the years to come. This great Jaguar team also taught me a lot of lessons. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them were embarrassing. These mechanics were world class, but you know, they had a, they had a penchant for poking fun at drivers. They'd poke fun at us and we'd poke fun right back at them. They would tell anybody who would listen that the most useless pieces of equipment they ever bring on a race weekend would be the driver. And so they poke fun at us and we poke fun right back at them. Now, unfortunately, they sometimes are right. And sometimes it can be embarrassing for a driver when you try and do too much yourself. It happened to me again in the same race because we're two hours into it. My teammate was one minute in the lead when I came into the pits. I got in, got strapped in, put my foot in the clutch, into gear, down the straight, 245 miles an hour, right out of the pit lane. I did my two hours and I got a call on my pit radio, Derek, pit next lap for a driver change. It was right before I pulled the gear lever back into top gear. You're not going fast enough until you're above 237 miles an hour to pull top gear in this thing. I pulled the gear lever back to top gear. The gear lever broke in my hand. What's even worse, I pulled it out of the gear that I was in. Now I'm, I've got no gears. The leading car, the fastest car in the race, I pull off to the side, the track marshals come out, push me back between a break in the guardrail, up against some trees. I jump out, I can see exactly what happened. The gear selector fork, what that is, is it's a fork that's connected to all the gears in the gearbox. It's a solid rod. Somebody had drilled up the middle of it to make it lightweight. They didn't deburr the inside of it, which means they left a jagged edge. A jagged edge causes a vibration. Vibration causes a crack, and after four hours it broke. But there was still about two inches still sticking out. They gave us a little toolkit just in case something broke. I opened up the toolkit. It had a vice grips wrench in it. I thought if I can get the vice grips wrench around this little two inch stub that's sticking out, yank it into any gear, I can drive it back to the pits. We've got 20 more hours, we can salvage something. So I go in, I lift up the bodywork, the word cut. See the word cut? That's where the bodywork. I lift it up, I get in over the wheels, everything's hot and sweaty. I get on the gears and I'm trying to yank this thing into gear. But have you ever tried to get a car or a motorcycle into gear without the engine running? You know how you have to rock it back and forth like this just to get the gears to align and slot in? Well, I couldn't do that when I leaned in from the side. So I walked around the back of the car. See the rear wing? See how low it is? I walked around the back of the car. I leaned over the car. Now I got on the gearbox. But the only way I could start making this thing rock back and forth is I started doing, <laughs> I started doing these pelvic thrusts. The sweat's running off me, I'm out of breath. I'm looking like something between a dog and heat and a porn star, giving it everything I can. <laughs> I look up and the live television cameras had arrived. I'm now on live television all across France, all across Europe. My sponsors and my mechanics are in the pit lane looking at the monitor thinking, what is he doing? What's broken? And what's he using to fix it? I gave it one last and it went into gear. I was fit to be tied. I threw the tools in, put the bodywork back on, got into the seat, put my foot in the clutch, fired the engine up, released the clutch. The thing was in reverse. <laughs> So remember, your team of people and the experts that you have around you, rely on them and don't take on too much yourself. OK, remember the first question I asked you? Why? Why was the number so small of people who got onto the victory podium? I want to try and keep it straight on, on, on time here. So I gave you a feel for how they think and operate. Let me go a level deeper. About seven or eight years ago, I had my first book published. I published this book because my son, my oldest son became an IndyCar driver. In fact, he will strap in next week for time trials for this year's Indy 500. He won a lot of championships, and I had moms and dads ask me, well, how does my son or my daughter do this? You have all the information, which I did. As a passion, I spent five years 
gathering all the information because I had access to it all and put it into this book. I was honored to have Mario Andretti write the foreword for this book. Let me just read you just two lines from his foreword. Derek's book teaches lessons that took guys like me years to learn. Quite honestly, I believe the advice in this book resonates far beyond the racing industry. It wasn't meant to do that. But I realized the power of the high performance principles of our sport could radiate way beyond the racing industry. Now, when he wrote that, I began to get so curious about other things I may have written. So I pulled this quote from one of his books. He said, desire is the key to motivation, but it's the determination and commitment to an unrelenting pursuit of your goal, a commitment to excellence that will enable you to attain the success you seek. Mario Andretti. Now, do you see the words I've underlined? You think it's the vocabulary of those extraordinary teams? Can't you see that's woven through the language of how those teams operate? Now, I'm fascinated by athletes in general, and I scour websites and magazines and newspapers to see if there's something else, anything else I can glean from famous athletes. And I pull these quotes here. This is an American athlete. He said, when I was younger, I was taught not to make excuses. Same American athlete. He said, you don't accidentally show up in the World Series. Derek Jeter. I'm not a big baseball fan, but I know who Derek Jeter is. He retired a couple of years now, but was he the model professional? But when you read those quotes, I was taught not to make excuses. You don't accidentally show up in the World Series. When you read those, you think, is that the attitude of the people? in those extraordinary teams? Of course it is. You don't accidentally show up with a good P&L. You don't accidentally show up with satisfied customer or new sales. OK, let's imagine for a minute. Let's imagine that we're on the victory podium at the Indy 500. Let's imagine that's our team of people right there. Actually, hang on a second. There we go. I don't know who's going to get the bill for that, but it's big, I know. So let's imagine that's our group of people there. You know the team who's been there more than anybody else in history? Team Penske, Roger Penske. The amazing thing about Roger Penske is I asked him one day, I said, do you employ people and put them in a position to be the best they can be? He said, no, not necessarily. He says, I like to put them in a position where they want to be the best they can be. Do you see the difference, that self-driver where you want to be the best you can be? The red and white car there, that's the car that Alan Ford Jr. won the IndyCar Championship with. When I, was, when I retired from uh, the cockpit and I was in television broadcasting, I stayed active by doing one track test a year. I would try and track test a championship winning car. I called Roger's team and said, could I track test Alan Ford Jr.'s? He said, yes. I met the team. First thing in the morning, they gave me a coin. I still have the coin right here. It's hard to see it, I know, but I still have the coin. That's what it looks like up there. The coin has an expression that Roger got from his dad. And what he does, he puts this coin into the first pay packet of every new employee, because he wants them all to buy into it. And what the coin says, if you look here on the back of it, it says effort equals results. It's on his desk, it's in the race shop, he gives it to every employee because he wants everybody to buy into it that effort equals results. And it does. But think about this. Mediocre effort equals mediocre results. Big effort equals big results. So let's imagine again for a minute. Just imagine for a minute we are going to run our own racing team at the Indy 500 in three weeks' time. Hang on a second here, what's this? There we go. <laughs> Hands up anybody who would like to be on this team. Oh, a lot, okay. You might have to run two cars. Do we have any good drivers here? Oh, we do, okay, you sure? Huh? Okay, so we can fill out. Here's our team. You know what's gonna be expected of you as we close out here. Now, Business is a lot more complex these days. We'll all agree on that. And you're on a growth path, and you're going to have to hit the accelerator every now and then. But it's amazing how things change and how quickly they change. 
Eight years ago, a Formula One pit stop took eight seconds. Car would drive in, the front man would jack it up, back man would jack it up, people would take the wheels off, more people would put more wheels on, jack down, jack down, accelerate, drive out, eight seconds. Six, six years ago, it was six seconds. Four years ago, it was four seconds. Two years ago, it was two seconds. Just last Sunday at the Miami Grand Prix, two teams did it in 1.9 seconds. Do you see what the focus is? The restless pursuit of marginal gains. You know, there's no passenger seats in our cars. We can't afford to carry unproductive weight that just sits there. Our drivers are trained, never focus on the rear view mirror. Glance at it, and always go forward. I like to tell people performance is personal, high performance is highly personal. There's a lot of people that would like to operate in the zone of peak performance, but do you know the zone of peak performance is not a crowded place? And there can be a high price for entry because it takes sacrifice, dedication, commitment, an element of risk, a lot of trust as you operate out on the edges. There's probably a lot of people here who see themselves in that zone. So we're going to run our team as we close out here. About five minutes before we strap our driver in, you're going to see scenes like this. I took these pictures. This is frontline people in a huddle getting their last minute instructions. If we were to listen in to what those last minute instructions, this is what we might hear. He's going to say, look, what we're about to try and do at this race will not be easy, but we've done extraordinary things in the past as a committed and aligned team of people. He's going to tell his driver, I want you to trust your frontline team when you come screaming down the pit lane looking for new wheels and tires and a full tank of fuel. He's going to remind his driver, you have preparation that's world class that'll give you the confidence to stand on that, that accelerator just a little bit harder and a little bit sooner. And then he'll say, look, if we just connect all these high performance dots, by default, we will position ourselves to get to celebrate on that victory podium more often than our competition. And that's my hope for everybody here. If I talk to Scott or to Bert in the years to come and they tell me that you're bigger and better and faster and more profitable and more extraordinary than ever before, and when he tells me that, I'll take some credit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so as we close out here, we're a couple of minutes over, but as we close out here, let me just say, one of the first questions I asked you, where does extraordinary live? The answer is within every one of us, as long as you remain obsessed with success. So when this conference is over, this summit is over, and you scatter back across the country to your place of business every day, I want you to start your engines, I want you to burn rubber, and I want you to be extraordinary. I'm Derek Daly, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Actually, can I, can I just say, Bert, sorry, how are you? Thank you. Can I just say, I'm going to be there tonight. Yes. So I'm going to be able to mix and mingle with anybody. If anybody has any questions about what we do or how we do it, I'd be delighted to have a chat. And we t can take some photos with the show car. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thanks. Derek Thank you. Daly. Uh, I mean, everything that guy said was just like, like strategy love for me. I mean, everything, mediocre effort, mediocre results, culture of extraordinary. I mean, all of that is just so great. And a lot of that is what we talked about today. And I, what I want to do is just wrap up really quickly before we, you know, all part and go to the zoo tonight and have fun with orangutans and stuff. Um, I wanted to just end with this really quickly, if we could, and tie it back to the beginning. Everything that we talked about today was potential. Potential. It's about being extraordinary. But what potential isn't is just a bunch of motivational pictures that you hang in your room. That's not what it's about. It's something a lot bigger than that. 
It's interesting because when we're younger, we look at all the potential that we have way, way out in the future. But there's some point in time, wherever it is, where you cross over. Where you cross over to begin to start thinking, did I lead enough? Did I do enough? Did I live up to what I was supposed to live up to? We start wondering whether or not we had the impact that maybe we had hoped we had had. But I think this is the wrong way to think about it. Absolutely the wrong way to think about it. How I would think about it is this parable. It's the parable of the oak tree. Out in the field, there's an enormous tree. It towers over everybody. 80 feet tall. The biggest of all the trees in all the field. The mighty oak tree. Strong, mighty, huge. But is that what makes it great? No. What makes it great is not that it's the biggest or it's the best. What makes it great is something different. It's the millions and millions of acorns that turn in to the forests that are so beautiful. That is what we do. It's not about the biggest. It's about the biggest impact. It's about those acorns. These are my acorns. It's about strength. The strength of our foundation and our culture. It's about impact. Because when we can do those things, we can be potent. I can be potent. We all can be potent. That is our potential. Our potential to be great. Thank you for today. Hope you had a great time. Tonight we're going to be at the zoo. We'll see you there. Derek will be there with a the car. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tonight.